Before we start this episode, I wanted to recognize how deeply saddened I was to hear the news about the death of Richard Foster. Richard and his wife Carol have contributed so much to the world of natural history filmmaking throughout their careers from their filmmaking studio and home in Belize. Richard will be remembered for his incredible commitment to wildlife filmmaking and highlighting issues to the environment and nature. I had the pleasure of interviewing Richard and Carol for the 10th episode of the podcast, and I was extremely touched by their obvious love for one another and the passion for their work that came across in our conversation. My heartfelt condolences go out to Richard's wife, Carol, and to his family. Richard will be deeply missed by the natural history filmmaking community. You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, episode 18. Galen Rosenwax is a marine scientist, explorer, photographer, and filmmaker. Always fascinated by the marine world, Galen began diving at 14 and has since continued exploring ocean ecosystems. She began her career at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, where she researched overwintering patterns of Southern Ocean zooplankton. Galen earned her master's degree in coastal environmental management from Duke University, working with the Tag a Giant program and conducting research on migratory movements of giant bluefin tunas. She has conducted field work throughout the world, from the Antarctic to the Arctic on icebreakers, to both the Pacific and Atlantic oceans on fishing vessels. To Galen, there is nothing better than being in the open ocean, surrounded by endless blue water and passing wildlife. Alarmed by the changes happening in the oceans, Galen founded Global Ocean Exploration to share her passion for ocean exploration, marine conservation and photography. Global Ocean Exploration is a company devoted to bringing cutting-edge expedition science to the public through photography, writing and film. Galen now participates and conducts expeditions in every ocean to alert the public not only to the challenges facing the oceans, but also to what science is doing to understand these changes. Galen is a US Coast Guard licensed captain and a fellow of both the Royal Geographic Society and the Explorers Club, where she has served as secretary of the board of directors. She also serves on the Conservation Committee of the Explorers Club and has been honoured to carry the Explorers Club flag on two of her expeditions to the Arctic. Galen has published articles and photographs in scientific journals, newspapers and magazines. She has also appeared as a scientific consultant, angler and on-camera presenter on the National Geographic series Fish Warrior. Galen is an accomplished public speaker, having delivered lectures at various institutions including the Explorers Club and Patagonia Inc. Her fine art photography has shown in galleries along the East Coast and can be found in many prestigious collections. Galen's passion for the ocean and conservation is infectious, and she hopes to inspire others to care about the planet through her work. Good morning, Galen. Thank you so much for taking time out to spend on the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So can you just give us a little bit of insight into how you got into uh, wildlife uh, TV and filmmaking? Now, I know you're, you're many things other than just a host and a filmmaker, um, but just kind of give us a bit of background on, on how you, you got here. Sure, absolutely. Essentially, I started out as a scientist. I've, I'm a marine biologist, and I was in the world of academia for a long time. And I reached a point where I became a little bit frustrated about the fact that nobody knew about the work that we were doing to understand important questions that everybody had and that media was posing. And I decided to sort of leave academia for a little bit and really pursue helping scientists communicate these messages so that everybody knew the research that was happening. And I ended up up in the Bering Sea and I was doing a project um, on climate change and the changing sea ice conditions up there and just really outreach. And it was fantastic. And so I was filming and photographing and writing. And then I ended up turning the camera on myself and really um, becoming the voice of the project, which I didn't anticipate as I did it. But I certainly found that it was an effective tool. 
It's it's really interesting the amount of scientists that um, that do this because uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's kind of finding a larger audience. Is is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the frustrations in science is that you're so constrained by academia and you're really doing what you're doing so that you understand the planet and also you want to share your passion. So I think there are scientists who are passionate about answering questions and there are scientists who are passionate about answering questions but also want everybody to know what they found and want everybody to share in their love of their findings and discoveries. And I think that that's why a lot of scientists become filmmakers and communicators, because we've got this, like, I want everybody to know about this amazing thing. I want everybody to see what we're discovering. And now you started kind of exploring when you were really young. I believe it was like 14 when you started diving. Is that right? Yeah, I started diving when I was 14. And before that, I had been in the water um, really since I was born. I think I was on a boat for the first time when I was two weeks old. Um, and just really always had a curiosity for the natural world. And I think it's partially in part, obviously, to my parents, because my mom always threw me into these situations. And we traveled tremendously um, as I was growing up. So I think that, you know, the exploration bug and that curiosity was planted um, very early on. And then as soon as I could start doing research and scientists would let me work with them, I started. So that was around the time I was in high school. So tell us a little bit more about your 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 background with your education, um, the the ty- kind of degrees you did, and leading up to when you kind of came out of academia. Yeah, so essentially, I did a undergrad in biology and art history at University of Pennsylvania, um, and after that, I worked at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for a year on Southern Ocean zooplankton. And what was amazing about that work was I was a guest investigator in a lab doing zooplankton research, and it actually culminated with a two-month expedition on an icebreaker to Antarctica, which sort of fulfilled one of these lifelong dreams of mine to go to Antarctica. And that was the seventh continent that I needed to go to. And I had these, I set these geographic goals to get to places before certain ages. And that was a huge accomplishment for me personally. And then, um, following that I was during that year I was applying to graduate school and I ended up at Duke where I got my master's of environmental management and I was doing a project on bluefin tuna migratory patterns so tagging satellite tagging and out on the water catching fish and putting big ta- putting satellite tags in them to track track their movements for better management purposes wow so you, so you really are completely at home on the ocean yeah absolutely that's my happy place. I always, I always <laughs> say that. It's like if I want to be happier, I need to just smile. I kind of forget about the world and I'm out there and it doesn't matter how rough it is or where it is. But if I'm surrounded by endless water, I'm very happy. And I think this is something that um, all wildlife filmmakers have in common. I find it incredible all the people I speak to on the show have this driving force. They would rather be out in the wilderness. They'd rather be out in the ocean doing things that, you know, drive them, that, that keep them alive. And it's that that really pushes them, I think, into TV to find this incredibly large audience and spread the word. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that works for you and, and how you were discovered for TV. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that is that really every day when I wake up, I ask myself the question, well, you know, because all of the challenges that you face in this sort of line of work, would I be happy doing anything else? And the answer is unequivocally no. So the sacrifice and all of the challenges that you face um, are really so worth it. And there's really just no other thing that I can imagine doing. And I certainly couldn't sit in an office and just any opportunity I have to be out in the field is is worth it. Um, as far as how I ended up on uh, Fish Warrior, it was actually pretty interesting because I had pitched a show in a speed pitching session um, at the Blue Ocean Film Festival in its first year, and I wanted to make a show about bluefin tuna since I had done my master's work on bluefin, and I had this sort of passion for fishing, but really I wanted to do an expedition show, so I said, you know what, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to go and do one of these five-minute pitch sessions, um, and I met one of the development people at National Geographic Channel and sort of was talking about expedition and my background and, you know, the show that I wanted to do. And then I said, oh, and I also subsequently had also made a little sizzle about fishing. So I showed her that at a follow up meeting. And then about a year later, 
um, I guess she had kept me in her Rolodex and she called me up and said, Hey, we have this show called fish warrior. We would love it. If you came on, we were doing this episode and it's on a, a sturgeon. So they're coming in and out of salt water and we think you would be a great addition. Um, so that's sort of how that happened. So it was pretty exciting. You, you mentioned uh, their speed pitching and sizzle reels. And this is a question that a lot of people bring up um, about pitching to networks. Um, now, you did a speed pitch at um, a conference. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and kind of how you put the pitch together? Um, you know, this is, this is one of those things that uh, a lot of people getting into the industry have no idea how to pitch. And I think it worries them to death about, you know, is it going to be the right format? Uh, can you just explain a little bit about how you put your pitch together? Yeah, and I can tell you that I had absolutely no idea how to do it when I did it that first time. And I still don't think I know. And I think the bottom line is that if you have a really great idea and you click with the person that you're pitching to, it doesn't matter what you put forward as long as you're organized. Um, and are thoughtful about what you're doing and show your passion. Because I, I honestly don't know the right formula, and I don't know that there is a formula. Certainly, if you have some footage and you put together a little clip, um, at that time I had just finished a web series that I did up in the Bering Sea, so I showed a clip of that. Um, I had a one-page uh, one pager written out about the show that I wanted to do. Um, and other than that, it was really, I sat down and then, we just had a conversation. Um, and I think it's just about, you know, really looking at it as a conversation to get that speed pitching was really about getting to know the person across the table from me more than even pitching is really about getting that second meeting, um, which I didn't realize at the time. I was tremendously nervous. I was, it was my first festival conference that I'd ever been to. It was the first time I didn't even know what speed pitching was. I had no idea. But as soon as I sat down, you know, it was just a conversation with somebody who, you know, could possibly help me um, or that I could collaborate with, just like anything. So I think that um, it's really about just communicating your passion more than having the perfectly um, dialed in pitch, especially when you're first starting out. I think now if I was pitching something that was more concrete and certainly because I've been in the industry longer, it would need to be much more polished. But starting out, I think as long as you communicate your passion and are clear with your thoughts, um, at least, and it also depends, I think, largely on who you're speaking to. But, you know, I think every, all of these, all of the commissioners and all of the producers want to meet passionate people. And that's what, as filmmakers, we're always looking for the next story. And I think that they're doing the same. I think it's great that obviously you had said that you know, you had no experience and didn't know the format and you went in there, but it worked out for you anyway. And, you know, you got a call back, which is so, so great. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so what now? So you're, you've, you've been on uh, Fish Warrior. Is that a show you're going to be going back on to, or are you looking at doing different types of shows from now on? Um, different. So that show just ran for one season. Um, and I was brought on as like a scientific consultant to help out the host um, so no more with that show, but, um, yeah, no, so I am, I'm sort of pursuing the hosting thing and also creating content on my own as well. Um, so sort of continuing to pitch things and talk to people and find people to collaborate with. Um, but in general, finding ways, really the most important thing to me is to be able to find ways to share my passion to a broad audience. Um, and so how best to do that. And I think with, all of the new media that exists, there's a lot of new ways to do it. Um, but certainly continuing to pursue the TV avenues. Um, and I do a lot with adventure and fishing and trying to incorporate science into the adventure um, so that we reach an audience that's not just the same audience that every is already very interested in the content that we're creating about the environment and about the natural world. And this new media that we're talking about social media obviously there's so many avenues that you can take now to share your passion um can you take us through some of the stuff that you are using i know we we both met just recently at the jackson hole wildlife film festival and there was a whole um uh, panel talking about social media and how it's now so important with uh, even just network tv how they're breaking into it now and finding a new audience because so many people are turning uh, to online content so what are you doing with online uh, uh, social media and online content right now? 
Yeah, so almost everything that I create um, is online. And I pretty much exclusively create shorts online um, when I'm creating and producing my own content. Um, so, and I started that actually from the beginning of my career when I made my first web series, which was actually back in 2008. Um, I think I released it in 2009, but we created just a web series that was eight, six episodes about our Bering Sea expedition and put it on YouTube and put it out to the world basically in a, you know, just here's some interesting content about the expedition. So I've continued to do that. Um, and then also created a fishing series that's just online. It's on various streaming networks, um, fishing networks, though. And then it's also on YouTube. So I think YouTube is a great way of getting shorter form things out. Um, and then certainly, you know, Instagram as a photographer, I think it's an invaluable resource, um, along with Facebook pages. Um, and because you have so many different demographics that are using all of the media in different ways. So it's about knowing who your audience in each different medium um, and who you want to target with that exact content. So for me, I focus on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then YouTube for the long, slightly longer form content. Now you're, uh, you, so you're a photographer as well. You've, you've had mm -hmm. your, uh, your fine art photography up in galleries. You're a filmmaker, you're, um, a, a scientist. You are the founder of, um, global ocean, uh, global ocean exploration. And, and so you've got so many things going on and obviously using all of those different social media, um, outlets, how do you manage that? How do you, how do you do it all? Um, with great difficulty and <laughs> right. lack and no sleep. Um, yeah, I think, I think it sort of goes back to what we spoke about, about passion. And if you're really passionate about what you do, then you want to create all this content and you don't mind if something else gets pushed out of the way in order to, you know, to make it all happen. Um, I think there's lots of different tools for, you know, scheduling content. I'm actually not very good at using those. I tend to just be more in the moment. Um, but I do definitely make plans of what I'm going to post and when I'm going to post. Um, but really, it's just about, you know, compartmentalizing and just time managing as well as you can and really never sleeping. And, and do so. you, and I, I totally get that. Um, and I'm the same with scheduling. It's one of those things that, you know, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of uh, management to be able to do that and creating a lot of content up, up front to, to get ready to schedule it. But do you have any other plan other than that? Or do you literally just go out, film something, take pictures, um, you know, whatever it might be, and then just post it? Or are you looking towards kind of the future, more long-term and uh, gathering content ready to put out, even if it's not scheduled per se? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think within every project that I do for, for work or for, or for fun or for a passion project, um, I'm always looking at where I can use the different content. And there might be something that I see that's appropriate for you know, the film that I'm creating, and then I'll see something that'll be just, you know, that Instagrammable moment or something like that. So I think that while a schedule is good so that you make sure that you, you keep your content rolling, it's also good to stay in the moment, but also just to be aware of everything going on so that you don't miss those moments. You know, lots of people who listen to this are people who are super inspired to try and, you know, make something work, whether it's trying to get on TV, whether it's trying to be a filmmaker, whether it's trying to produce, direct, or do social media content. And I think so many people are just lost when it comes to that stuff. And they think that they see people like you and they see other people online, they think people have it all together and they've got it all sussed out. And I think the reality of that is not the case at all. We're all just learning and, you know, kind of flying by the skin of our pants. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think absolutely. We're all figuring it out as we go. And I wish there was a magic formula. I wish somebody could sit me down and teach me. I wish there was an instruction manual, but I haven't found it yet. So if, if you do find it, please let me know. <laughs> um, but I just try to really feed back on, on what people respond to the most. Um, I like to post a lot of content about all of my expeditions, but I find that on Instagram, the things that people respond to the most are fishing pictures. So what I try to do is I'll post a fishing picture, but then I'll tell a story. So maybe they're just looking at the picture and then sometimes they might actually read the story about the fish that I'm talking about. So we throw a little science and conservation in along with that 
fish picture. Fantastic. So. Yeah. So it's inspiring in two ways. You know, it can be just, I, I think what I love about social media is you can flick through there and you can see so many inspiring pictures. And it's not like you have to read every single um, comment on there or every single story. But at some point when it, it, it attracts you, it's there. And that's kind of when you get those longtime followers and people who are passionate in the same way of what you're doing. Right, exactly. So tell us a little bit more about global ocean exploration. What what are you trying to do with that? Um, well, essentially what I'm trying to do with it is help scientists communicate what they're doing in the field to, un to understand sort of the big media questions that we hear about. So climate change, ocean acidification, overfishing. Um, it was really the, the passion project that I started when I left academia. I said, what can I do? And I went on this expedition and I basically just launched into this. It's basically a media consulting company that I'll get hired by an expedition. I get written into their grants often to help them create their content for their outreach. Um, and then we'll run blogs. We'll make short films. I mean, it really depends on the project, what it ends up being. But it's really about creating content that the scientists can use either in their presentations or for larger media audiences to really get people inspired about field science. That's fantastic. And, and I think what goes along with this is that um, you are a woman in a, a fairly male dominated um, uh, scientific area. And I think you're a huge inspiration to many women who want to go on and do things like you're doing and have passion projects like that, where you really want to inspire with, with your passion. Um, what kind of advice do you have for anyone out there who's, who's listening to this, who has ideas, but really just don't know where to start. Yeah, I think it's 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 always easy to say just follow your passion, but in reality, there's a lot more to it than just following your passion. But I think really the one piece of advice that I got when I was in graduate school from my advisor was whenever you're on a team or working with anybody, make yourself indispensable so that you'll always be the person that they call for the next job or you'll be the person that they want in the field with them. Um, and I think that that's the most, that's one of the best pieces of advice that I was ever given that I like to sort of push forward. And I think it's also, you know, do the best that you can, show that you're passionate, and then people respond, you know, and I think that, you know, the harder you work and the better job you do and get as good as you can at everything that you do, um, people will appreciate that. They appreciate when you're good at something, but they also appreciate when you're trying your best. Um, and so really, I think that whether you're a man or a woman, it's the same advice. It's just be the best that you can be at what you're doing um, and then go from there. And then, of course, you need the passion to sort of push you through those sort of harder moments. Yeah, I love that. I think it's great advice. Um, you know, I say to people the same thing. If you're out there, you're trying to get um, callbacks to be on crews and things. Don't just go out and do your job. Help be part of a team and do anything you can to facilitate the, the end goal, which might be filming or exploration or whatever it might be, research. Um, indispensable. That's, that's fantastic. So, Tell us a little bit about when you're out there and you're doing your, you're out um, doing a research and you're filming yourself, you're saying, you're taking pictures, you're, you're tying all these things in together. Tell us a little bit about the gear that you use, because again, this is something I think people feel like they have to have a, a, a red camera or a, you know, a big Sony camera or, or, you know, something very big and expensive to capture this stuff. And I don't think that's really the case. So tell us about what you use to, to do that. Yeah, I absolutely don't think that that's the case. I think whatever you have with you um, should be good enough. Um, and I, I've never shot a red camera. I think it would be amazing too, but I haven't done it. Um, I think it's also knowing where your output's going to go. So if I know that my content's going to only be online, there's no reason to be shooting something like a red camera. You can shoot that on a small, compact HD camcorder. My first expedition I shot on an HD prosumer um, Sony camcorder sort of deal. And it was fantastic footage. It looks beautiful. I still use it to this day. I've sold it and it's amazing. So I think use the best thing that you can afford, but I don't think you need to go crazy. I shot my last film all on a Canon 5D because um, we both had them. That's why I, I had actually hired a camera guy to come with me. And he and I both had 
a 5D. So that was the camera that we went with. Um, but I think that, you know, you also have to, with me, I'm a five foot two woman, so I can't always carry all of the gear that I want to. I like to be as compact as possible. Um, and yeah, so it's really about, you know, judging where you're going, the size, what your weight limitations are, where you're, you know, and exactly where you're going to put your content and then don't get over, you know, overburdened by worrying about what you're shooting on. Yeah, great advice. I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. It's about the where it's going to go. And so much of the content, as you're saying, that people are watching on their phones these days. And although, you know, what some of these giant, uh, big, expensive cameras take amazing footage and it looks great on there, you know, you can take footage with your iPhone or your, your Android phone and it looks almost just as good, you know, these days. The equipment's getting so incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the day, it's about the story that you're telling more than the equipment that you're using, for at least for the content that I'm creating. I'm not creating a blue chip documentary. I'm not filming Planet Earth 2 or 3. Or, so I think that you have to bear that in mind as well. Absolutely. Now, you've traveled uh, a lot. You've been to Antarctica. You've been to Ar the Arctic. Uh, you've been all over the world, all over the oceans. Tell us a bit about some of the most incredible experiences you've had. If you had to pick one or two of the experiences that you've had um, uh, traveling, what would those be? Oh, it's always a hard question to answer. Um, but I have to say, I think that um, the two places that always um, stand out for me was I was fortunate to travel throughout Indonesia when I was a little girl. And when I was about eight years old, we were in Bali and I had this amazing experience on an outrigger canoe and I was with my family. And it was really the first time that I was thrown in the water in the most incredibly pristine environment that I'd ever seen. And the colors, I saw an octopus swim by and I just remember these brilliant flashes of colors everywhere. And I think for me, that sort of set this bar of, wow, this is what the ocean is. It's this just amazing gems and jewel colors and movement and just so much life. Um, so I think that for me, that was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in the ocean. And I couldn't tell you anything that I saw to this day because, you know, to me, I was a little girl. I had no idea what it was, but it's still one of the most magical experiences I've had um, in or on the water. And then I think following that, I it's really the first time I saw Antarctica and that first big expedition that I had done because it was physically, mentally, every kind of challenge that you can face, I really faced on that expedition. I was very young. It was my first big expedition. We had really big seas. We had terrible weather. We were in sea ice. It was so cold. I was putting out these big instruments. Um, and for me, being away for two months and knowing that I had no way of getting back except when we were going to return was challenging, but I also was fulfilling a goal of someplace I had ever wanted, I had wanted to go. And it's really one of the only places where I had set these expectations of what it would be that were very high, but it completely surpassed them. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, it's kind of hard to put into words. Um, but just the way that the air felt and the color and like the lack of color, but yet so colorful and just that feeling of peace and just absolutely stunning scenery because we were in sea ice almost the whole time, um, which is very magical. Yeah, that sounds incredible. And and again, I think it comes back to passion because much of what you were saying there sounds like it was really cold and hard at times. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, what an incredible experience. I mean, to go somewhere that very few people have really been in, in terms of the population of the planet, you know, it's a very small number of people that have been out there doing that kind of work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think also the time of year that we were down there, I was there in Austral Fall. So it was really, we were some, we were the last ship that was going to be down there before winter. And it, um, it just made for an absolutely incredible light and everything about it was just incredible. And I remember just every time I'd see the big seas or I would be miserable, I'd be like, well, tomorrow the sun might come out and everything will be, you know, just magical and everything will be great. And it really did happen that way. And I think, it really set the tone for the rest of my um, expeditions and really my life because I learned how to deal with every situation in those two months that I would face or have faced really um, in the rest of my career being at sea and on the oceanographic expeditions. Wow. Well, 
let's say we you you have the biggest budget you could imagine right now and you have <laughs> the best gear that you could imagine and uh you know you can have a ticket to anywhere in the world what would your your um, expedition be right now to go and film or photograph where would you go oh that's a good question there's so many places um and there's so many projects to do um although I'm on this really big predator kick right now. Um, so I think that I want to try to do projects on sort of the large marine predators um, and interacting with them in the wild. So I just got back from a trip with white sharks. I'm coming up on a trip to do, um, to be in the water with orcas. Um, so sort of along those lines, um, it's definitely exciting. Um, Oh man, that's such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> it is and it isn't, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's one of those things. I think though, if I had um, if I had an unlimited budget, I would love to create a series that was about um, that didn't just preach to the choir. It would be a fishing series that really preached to the fishing audience and got them involved in the conservation world and taught them how to be better fishermen for the planet, not just for sort of their their meat in the box, as they like to say. Right. And so <clears throat> when you look at TV programs today um, on all of the, the networks, I, I think, you know, so much of us um, look at it that you know, conservation is a very small part of what really goes on on TV. You know, so much of it is purely there for entertainment. Um, how do you see that? Do you think things are changing now? Do you think we're starting to see more conservation issues coming to the forefront of TV? I think we are in a lot of ways, as long as it's masked in entertainment. And I think that's the bottom line. Um, I, I certainly hope that we have more conservation thrown in, but I also don't want it to come across as preaching on a soapbox. And I think that conservation is a very important topic, but we also need to always tell people what they can do to solve these problems or to contribute to helping um, solve the problems. Because if we just say conservation is important, well, everybody's going to agree with that. But what can individuals do on a daily basis? Um, and I'm hoping that with media, it definitely seems like it is changing towards at least putting in tidbits of everything within the programming. I don't know if we'll see a pure conservation show anytime in the near future. But I certainly think that in almost every, sh in very many of the shows and programming that we're seeing now, there certainly is at least a glimmer of conservation thrown in or at least a sentence or two. Um, and that's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. And I, I think we can agree that at the uh, Jackson Hole Film Festival, the, the, the word conservation and with the panels that were there, it was far more orientated towards conservation than I've ever seen before. And I think that's, um, that's a huge step in the right direction. But as you say, people are tuning in for entertainment at the same time. So keeping it lighthearted and, uh, you know, fun to watch is also very, very important. Yeah, no, definitely. Hey, it's been fantastic speaking with you today. Um, if you had to give a, just a nugget more of advice, we've spoken about passion, which I think is probably the most important thing, and using you know any gear that you really have to get going. Is there anything else that you could use to help inspire people to move forward with their goals? You know, I think that it's really about learning as much as you can from everybody around you and never miss an opportunity to learn something new if it presents itself would be the other thing that I would, would say, um, whether it's a skill in terms of, you know, adventure and you need to climb to see, you know, whatever you're studying or if you need to be a better free diver so that you can, you know, reach that species that you want to see or a higher level of training and scuba diving, but really, you want to minimize your risk in everything you do. So get as skilled as ever at everything that you can do um, and learn as much as you can. Uh, I think that's so. fantastic advice. Thank you. So where can people find you online? If they want to go and check out the stuff that you're doing, where can they, where can they find that? So I have two websites. One is galenrosenwax.com and the other is my company website, globalocean.exploration.com. And then on social media, my handle is at Galen Go Explore. 
Awesome, Galen. Thank you so much. As always, we will put links to all of those uh, on your web episode page on masterwildlifefilmmaking.com. Thanks again for taking time out this morning. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully speak to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series. You can find out more information on wildlife filmmaking at masterwildlifefilmmaking.com, where you'll find valuable free resources like downloadable reports and video tutorials. Thanks for listening.